Welcome back for uh, Greenlock for Node.js part three. Um, in this section, we're gonna talk about security. Specifically, there are three types of attacks you need to be aware of, and a couple of common mistakes that can be made, most of which are mitigated by Greenlock automatically, but some of which are not. So right where we left off, I've got our um, uh, Greenlock file here. Uh, I haven't changed our approved domains function. The only thing that I'm gonna change immediately is I'm gonna actually turn off some of the security so that I can demonstrate to you what, uh, what can go wrong. And then we'll turn that back on and then talk about things that Greenlock can't predict against and what you can do. So uh, first of all, We've got these two options, SNI allow dangerous names and SNI preserve case. And these affect both um, the SNI handling, as in stuff uh, that the server name before it even gets to the approve domains callback. So before it even gets here, it's checked to make sure it's valid. So I'm turning off those validity checks um, and also turning off the normalization of case so that it always comes in lowercase. Uh, and that also affects the HTTP and HTTP2 um, that Greenlock serves because as uh, they're very, very lightweight, but it does have a thin uh, wrapper function that, that checks host headers and those as well. So let me just go ahead and show you uh, what I was talking about. So we'll start with uh, some benign examples first. So let me go back here. So test.people.family is an allowed domain on our server. So the server is just freshly booted up. When I hit enter, oh, by the way, this, um, this OpenSSL, where did it go, is a TLS client. And so it's not handling HTTP or SMTP or any of the protocols that live under TLS typically. It's just handling um, the TLS. So I, I, with this, I can spoof um, TLS names and, and put in arbitrary data to be able to show you what these exploits could be. So this it works as expected. Um, this, uh, the approved domains callback is called because those, there was, the server was just booted, those domains weren't in, in cache yet, or the, the certificates for those domains weren't in cache yet. If I do it again, we'll see that the approved callback isn't called a second time because now those certificates are in cache. Um, and uh, it's, it actually calls the approved domains callback before it checks the cache because in that options parameter, let me actually just go back and show you that again. In this options parameter, there's actually the ability to change the challenge type, um, where it should be looking for the certificates, like various things like that. So that's why this actually happens before the cache gets checked, just as an FYI. So here, uh, let me do that again. Oops. So again, we can see it's only come up once. But now I'm gonna do something a little more malicious. So now I'm gonna have our friend uh, uh, Bobby Tables visit us. So you would think, you know, TLS, it's a secure protocol. And in the design of the spec, it should say that if you've got a certain field, like the server name indicator, that it should only contain valid data. Well, it turns out most implementations don't actually check this, or maybe not most, but at least the ones I've encountered don't check this. So you can see um, if you were thinking, oh, you know, this is TLS, it's safe, I'll just take the server name and then query my database with this string, you could see that very easily you could become subject to an injection attack. Um, likewise, if you're doing virtual hosting and the way that you're checking is doing fs.readdir um, and then uh, looking to see if a directory exists in a particular location and you're using something like uh, path.join to take in the server name. Uh, if you weren't, if there was no protection available, then somebody could do something like this. You'd get that in, you'd go ahead and happily path.join it. And then um, you would have uh, potentially be vulnerable to a timing attack where somebody could discover whether or not certain files exist on your system, especially depending on what user the web server is running as. 
so likewise, this can be done with TLSS and I, and I don't think that it's any surprise to anybody that it can also be done with um, uh, the headers, the, the host headers in just regular HTTP once it's gone beyond TLS and being interpreted. So for example, um, if you have uh, redirects or something like that, somebody could be putting uh, HTML in here, or they could, you know, if you they're expecting that you're looking up in a database to see what host uh, parameters should be loaded for this host, you, you could be subject to SQL, SQL injection that way. So this is something else that in this particular example, because I turned off the security, uh, Greenlock isn't handling it, but um, uh, normally it would. So, and then I'll, I'll talk about this meta redirect uh, in just a second. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, whoops, I'm going to go ahead and turn back on um, the security there. So it's not going to allow bad names anymore. Now I'm just going to talk about um, a mistake that happens sometimes. So uh, some, some clients actually don't normalize the casing before they send it to you. And so you could get something where you've got a valid domain coming in, but uh, the, the casing's not valid. So that's something else that we take care of, um, is we lowercase both SNI names and host headers. So let me take that option away. And now we'll see when this comes in. It's normalized, even though the client that sent it uh, didn't normalize it. And there are valid clients out there that have um, that, that have these capitalization problems. Um, and since there are, you know, potential use cases where maybe you're doing like uh, an SNI knock or a host name knock or something like that, and you actually do want to be able to put arbitrary data in there, if that's your use case, well, now you've just learned the options to turn these things off. Although I have a hard time believing that uh, almost anyone that's listening to this would or watching this would, would have that. Um, the other thing that we have is uh, you'll have things like uh, yahoo.com and google.com will be showing up in your logs and every single time uh, somebody makes a request for that it's going to show up in the logs because there's no certificates if everything's configured correctly you're not uh, trying to request any certificates but this is um, this is a potential attack against you I, I don't know what it benefits the attacker in general um, but the, the way that this attack could affect you is if you're not guarding against uh, unauthorized host names at all you're going to hit your rate limit with let's encrypt very quickly because several times a day you're going to have these invalid domains that you don't own um, coming in and let and, and Greenlock would be triggered to say, oh, let me try to get a certificate for this if you're not blocking that or, or you know, whitelisting which domains. Also, if you're not doing it correctly, you could end up in a set situation where um, you have the prefix of something that you don't allow uh, coming in, which may or may not actually uh, work because your server may or may not be handling that or in other cases um, as a post fix. Uh, so, you know, make sure that you're matching exactly and it's not possible for an attacker to use a domain that you do allow in front or behind a domain that you didn't intend to allow. Um, the same is true with anything that you do in your host name checking. That's something that Greenlock can't take care of for you because Greenlock doesn't know about your server and what your needs are and, uh, you know, that's very application specific to you. Um, so one more thing that I'll talk about, I think I mentioned, uh, I mentioned the timing attack. So one more thing that I'll talk about that, um, uh, Greenlock does for you. Uh, oh, we'll, we'll see this in action now. So here again, both on HTTP and HTTPS, we'll see that invalid headers, um, are not allowed, even if it looks a lot like a domain example dot slash com you know only uh, valid domain characters are allowed so there are some things like dot dot um, it, it and or it, there, there are some combinations it's 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 a very simple check it's just the 39 characters that are allowed but um, if you, you have a situation where you get something like this that's technically not a valid domain that's also not very uh, attackable so 
we wanted to keep it just very, very simple and thin and light. So it's just checking for the characters that are allowed, FYI. Um, so, but we do see this, this meta redirect here. And so I want to um, talk to this a little bit. So uh, some people, when they first see that, that uh, for redirecting from HTTP to HTTPS, that the built-in functionality is meta redirects, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa that's kind of weird. Why not use headers? Well, there's a really good reason, which is that when you use a header to redirect in many clients, and most clients, that is automatic. Now, for a web browser and for a Google search engine, a meta redirect functions exactly the same as a, a header redirect. But for clients that people use in programming languages like Node, Python, Java, Go, etc., many of those HTTP clients have automatic redirects turned on. So you could get into a case where an API developer is trying to reach your site and getting a redirect that's working and not knowing that because he made a typo or she made a typo that every time that HTTP request goes out that it is actually sending information in the clear and then redirecting and reconnecting um, on the encrypted socket but it's it was showing all that information in the clear first so that's something that's particularly in, important to note and uh, I don't know of any any reason that you wouldn't want to do this it's it's not really increasing the size of the transmission because um, for compatibility compatibility with clients even when you're doing a header redirect you're going to send a body uh, um, of a, a certain length of bytes just so that it it meets a criteria for backwards compatibility um, and it, it, like I said, it's functionally the same, like in terms of browsers, uh, just like it would with a header, the user's going to download the content, the, the browser's gonna download the content, it's going to interpret it, it's gonna cause the redirect to happen. So functionally, it's the same both with the header redirect and the meta redirect uh, for search engines, etc. It's also the same. So I don't know of any downside to this. I only know of the upside that it helps, um, you know, prevent a couple of oopses. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of confidence and makes you aware of some things that we take care of for you and that you need to take care of for yourself.